My guest this week is an economics professor who, according to his Twitter bio, was quietly writing obscure academic texts for years until he was thrust onto the public scene by Europe's inane handling of an inevitable crisis. Yanis Varoufakis, welcome to the Rubin Report. It's great to be here. Thank you. Yanis Varoufakis. I mean, Greek people have by far the best names on earth. Is that fair to say? Not in the slightest. You should have seen what kind of life I lived in Britain as a young person with a surname like mine. <laughs> did did you know, they, they butcher that constantly? Chance. Oh, yeah, you can imagine. Um, you know, strategically as well. <laughs> I'm sure strategically. All right, so you are in Athens right now, and we are yes. going to do a lot on Greece. And I just mentioned to you before we started, I haven't done much on Greece, even though it's really right in the center of everything happening economically in the world and everything going on in the EU right now and everything else. So for the people that know nothing about Greece, can you explain why your Twitter bio says what it says? Hmm. Well, back in the late 1990s, uh, a remarkable experiment in monetary economics took place in Europe. In our great infinite wisdom, we Europeans tried to bind monetarily together very disparate economies without any uh, mechanism for recycling surpluses, for keeping checks and balances in uh, the capital inflows and outflows. Uh, any kind of economic union uh, was askewed, sort of put on the back burner uh, while pushing forward the monetary union. And whenever you bind together different economies, uh, monetarily. We've seen this uh, with the gold exchange standard in the mid-war period. We've seen it with uh, various pegs between the United States dollar and various uh, Central and Latin American currencies. Uh, we saw it in Europe in the 1980s and early 1990s with the European exchange rate mechanism. When you try to put together, to, to effectively, effectively to fix exchange rates uh, without completing the political union, the fiscal union, the banking union. The banking union is being the most important thing. You, know, you need to have a single banking um, sector mm -hmm. throughout one currency area. So when you do that, what happens is uh, the first few months, years, resemble, this is an, an allegory uh, that I use, it resembles invading Russia. Um, think of Napoleon, think of Hitler. A wonderful beginning. You know, the troops <laughs> storm across the steps. Right. Uh, it all looks fantastic. It's working. And then um, at some point, bitter winter takes hold. And it ends up very badly with blood on the snow and so on and so forth. Ask Napoleon. Um, so it's exactly the same thing. What happens is this. Uh, in every economy, in every currency union, there are surplus areas, areas that produce surpluses like California. And there are deficit areas, like Missouri. In, in Europe, it's Germany and uh, Greece. Within Germany, it's Eastern Germany and Western Germany. There will always be surplus producers and deficit producers. Uh, and when that happens in a monetary union, uh, there is a tendency for the surpluses to uh, travel from uh, the banks where they accumulate to the deficit areas in the form of loans. Why? It's evident. Every time a Greek bought a Volkswagen or a BMW, uh, a certain amount of money went to the Frankfurt banks, from the Greek banks, uh, because by definition, Germany always had, always will have a trade surplus with a place like Greece. Mm -hmm. uh, there is going to be excess capital accumulating in the Frankfurt banks. What do bankers do when they have excess capital? They try levels of private debt. Uh, very low, the lowest in the world, mm -hmm. at least in the developed world. Um, bankers look at even a poor Greek family that have their own home and they have no debt and they think, hmm, these are fantastic customers. You know? They are not indebted. Uh, they have collateral. We lend them. So a tsunami of capital goes from the surplus country to the deficit country. This, uh, because there is a reason why Greece is a deficit country, it's because we have far less um, uh, of an industrialization success story happening. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, we have small firms that cannot compete in tradables with the large conglomerates of Siemens and Volkswagen and IEG and so on. Uh, the money comes in 
and it effectively bids up asset prices, house prices, uh, and various other non-producing, non-productive assets. Uh, that creates a semblance of growth. People real think that, oh my God, my house is now worth double what it was. So they get another loan and they get another credit card. And that means that they buy more Volkswagen. So the Germans are happy, the Greeks are happy. But this is the invading Russia part, when everything looks hunky-dory, when it really is nothing other than a Ponzi scheme. It is a dead-fueled pseudo-growth uh, situation. And then eventually something happens, usually beginning with Wall Street, <laughs> like it did in 2008, like yeah. before that happened in 1929. Uh, whatever the reason is, uh, th- there is a pin that, that pricks the, the bubble, the bubble bursts. And then what happens? What happens is exactly what happened in the 1930s. The greatest burden of adjustment falls on the weakest of shoulders, the Greek shoulders, the Portuguese shoulders, the Irish shoulders. Uh, shoulders. And then suddenly, the, the surplus countries realize that they have effectively created a lot of assets in countries that are collapsing. Mm -hmm. But because you have a monetary union, and it's not just a fixed exchange rate, it's much harder than that, because we don't have just a peg between a Greek currency and the German currency. We have the same damned currency. Mm -hmm. So you can't do what Argentina did. You cannot sever the peg and devalue, because you don't have a currency to devalue. (laughs) You have to create your own currency in order to devalue it. You know, this is like... um, uh, foreshadowing a devaluation a year before it happens. It's, you, you just need to state it to realize the, the extent of the costs involved mm-hmm. and the collapse that that would bring. Um, so what happens is the alternative is um, internal def- uh, devaluation. So the creditors come here, and this is the crime against logic that was committed in May of 2010. We had the Greek state bankrupt, uh, it, there was no way it could roll over its debt. It did not have a currency that it could value, and it did not have a central bank. <laughs> so right. imagine two thousand eight in the United States. Yeah, imagine two thousand and eight in the United States without the Fed, right, and without the capacity to devalue the dollar even mm-hmm. vis-a-vis the yen, the the euro, and so on and so forth. I mean, it's just my complete and utter madness. Right. Um, so what did they do? In, in you know, it, it, it is quite astonishing. They came to the Greek state and they said, okay, we'll bail you out. But of course, it wasn't even a bailout. Right. What they did was they gave to the Greek state the largest amount in humanity's history, in absolute terms. Remember, Greece is a little pipsqueak of a country. It's a tiny little place, 2% of the European economy. 2%, it's the, the Delaware <laughs> of Europe. <laughs> right. Yeah? So imagine, imagine if the powers that be, the IMF, the Fed, the Treasury, uh, the World Bank, were to descend upon Delaware and give the government of Delaware, of the state of Delaware, the largest sum in human history on conditions of austerity that guarantee to shrink the income of the people living there. Right. Now, if you are, how, how old do you need to be to realize this cannot end well? Eight? Nine? Uh, <laughs> in you America, it's, it's a little older in America. We're not that bright. Let's say 14. No, I don't think so. Americans understand bankruptcy. Yeah? Better okay. than Europeans. Okay. They understand bankruptcy. You know what I think that most Americans understand? That you cannot escape a bankruptcy through loans. You, know? you can escape a crisis of liquidity through loans, but you cannot escape bankruptcy through loans, right. especially when the loans are given. Imagine, imagine if um, uh, Lehman Brothers, Mr. Fouts, went to Hank Paulson in 2008, as he did, and he were to say to him, you know, cap in hand, help me. And imagine if the answer was, uh, I'm not going to bail you out. I'm not going to let you default, yeah, go bankrupt, and I, but I'm going to give you a six percent interest, six percent, think six percent interest rate in, in the middle of the collapse, right? When interest rates were crashing to zero, right? I'll give you a loan by which you will make whole all your creditors, and you, you will get this loan on condition that you will shrink your revenues. <laughs> you know, that, that, I don't think that Hank Paulson would ever imagine of saying that. I right, know he hated course. Lehman Brothers, but even though he hated Lehman Brothers, he would never have... A, this is what happened with Greece. Right. So, so the reason why Greece is in the news since 2010 yeah. is because of this. I mean, of course, the reason why they did it, it's not, they were not idiots. They knew that this was not going to work. But it was an, an underhanded way of saving France's and Germany's banks because they had stupidly lent a lot of money to the Greek government. They already had all the toxic derivatives that they had amassed from the other side of the Atlantic. 
Uh, they had already been bailed out by the French and the Greek and, and the German governments to the tune of 500 billion American dollars, the German banks only, a few months before Greece. And then suddenly, uh, another 200, 300 billion would have to be given to them to compensate for the, the chain reaction that would happen if Greece defaulted, because then it would be Portugal, it would be Ireland, and so on. So instead of doing the right thing, which is to say, okay, let the Greek state default and take the pain of bankruptcy, and we will recapitalize the banks and effectively nationalize them, do a tarp to mm -hmm. what happened in Italy. Instead of doing that, they lied to 19 parliaments simultaneously. 19 parliaments, the parliaments of the Eurozone, they said, what we're going, we, out of solidarity, we have to help Greece overcome its problems. It was not a, a case of helping Greece <laughs> overcome. Right, right. It was a case of helping Deutsche Bank, Societe Generale, Finance Bank, overcome their problems without telling the German taxpayers that the Greek bailout was all about their own banks. So, but you see, once you, you, you commit this uh, crime against logic, uh, it's like Macbeth. You can't commit a crime, you have to commit a second crime uh -huh. to cover up the first. So that's the second bailout. Now, I was elected um, and appointed by the prime minister, uh, finance minister, in order to stop this and to say to them, folks, no, no more. We're not going to get a third bailout from you um, only to extend the, the crisis into the future, pretending that we have solved it. So that's more or less the story. All right, so you've given me a lot to work with there. So let's back up a little bit and start at the beginning. So when all this was happening, before the Federation came together, before the EU was coming together, before all the currency was being mixed and all of that, were there voices in Greece? Were you one of the voices that were saying, guys, this is not going to work? There were a few voices, but we were drowned out by a cacophony of celebration at the prospect of monetary union. And the reason is that they were, there was just too much at stake uh, in terms of various uh, kinds of profiteering that was being envisaged at the time. Mm -hmm. um, there were too many, many vested interests. And it, come to think of it, um, a monetary unification um, is extremely powerful as a weapon uh, by various powerful forces. So if you think about in terms of uh, um, German industry, you know, the industry of the exporting, the net exporters, they love the idea of a monetary union because they don't have to worry about constant devaluation, let's say of the Italian lira, which constantly uh, resuscitates the competitiveness of fiat cars, Italian cars. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the surplus countries have an interest in monetary union. But even in the deficit countries, which in the end always end up suffering, there is an interesting class distinction, social class distinction. So if you go to the northern suburbs of Athens, which are the leafy ones, the, 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 the nice suburbs with the beautiful villas, I mean, a lot of tax evading has gone into building them. Um, but nevertheless, you know, these are the, the rich Greeks. Uh, they hated the drachma. Because every time the drachma devalued, their dollar value of their mansion or their yacht would diminish. So they wanted their own assets to be redenominated in Deutschmark. Right. And let's face it, the euro is a Deutschmark, right? Uh, but they managed, the, the whole system, the whole establishment managed to even convince the working class, uh, even the labor unions. Think about it. You are a unionist. You organize. You spend a year organizing a strike. It's not an easy job to organize a strike. There's a lot of hardship. There's a lot of backlash. Um, the workers go on strike. They lose income. They, they manage to get a five percent pay rise. Let's say. Yeah. And then two days later, there's a devaluation. They lose it. Right. Right. <laughs> so they were con also convinced that a hard currency would be good for them. Now, of course, that means that you know, it takes a certain illiteracy when it comes to macroeconomics to be convinced <laughs> of that. But it's not difficult to see how uh, somebody who sees their hard-earned gains being depleted by devaluation vis-à-vis -vis the Deutschmark to say, I want the Deutschmark. I want to be paid in Deutschmark like the Germans are. Why shouldn't I be there? So when you have this coalition of, of different interests, uh, I, I, I remember when I was writing articles, um, um, articulating my and expressing my great misapprehension about the euro, I was being treated as an eccentric um, and as uh, somebody who had not caught up with the times, who had not oh. understood that there is a new paradigm now of risk, 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 which dissipated, uh, 
You know the story. <laughs> How much of that then is also tied into just the way politicians, not only in Greece, but all over the world, the way they operate, which is that they want sort of short-term gains. So in a way, you know, they're saying, oh, well, we want to help these rich people in Athens. They want to feel good about their money and all that and their property and all that stuff. And then we'll sort of put off what's going to happen long-term for somebody else to deal with 20 years. I'm guessing they didn't think even if they knew what was gonna happen, they didn't think it was gonna happen so quickly, right? So it's also just sort of the way all of our politicians are designed to, to act. That's correct. But look, that has always been a problem with politics. Uh, liberal democracies have always favored short-termism, always. But there is a huge uh, sea change from the 1970s onwards, not just in Greece, in the United States, in Europe, everywhere. Uh, and that is because of financialization. With the end of Bretton Woods after the early 1970s and the unshackling of uh, finance, the fact that suddenly finance became sexy and uh, turbocharged mm -hmm. through various uh, uh, instruments that were being developed to take ad advantage of the unshackling of finance after the end of Bretton Woods. Uh, what happened was the, the, the relative power of uh, the financial sector grew inexorably vis-a-vis -vis the political sphere. So the way I understand capitalism, there are three spheres of power. There is the political sphere, the economic sphere, the real economy sphere, you know, people, you know, companies making things, and there is finance. Mm -hmm. uh, and the power, the, 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 the power balance between them co constantly shifts. In the 1970s, there was a massive shift from away from the political sphere to the financial sphere, to put it very bluntly. Uh, if you were President Eisenhower or JFK, you had a lot more power as a president than you did um, as President Carter or indeed George W. Bush. Uh, the, the, you know, political goods diminished in value compared to financial goods. Mm -hmm. And that Look, it makes sense, doesn't it? Um, the best and the brightest were no longer drawn to the political sphere. Because if you really were, you know, 25 years old, you were up and coming, you were smart and so on, and you wanted to change things, it was much easier to change things, you know, by entering Goldman Sachs or um, some other, or if, you know, if you wanted to be in politics, to go into the International Monetary Fund, mm -hmm. than, than becoming a senator or a Greek member of parliament. So th this is my response to your question, that by the time we created the euro, the, uh, and throughout the, the Western world, the quality of politicians had uh, fallen, had subsided. And the result was that short-termism increased. Because we, we lack the leaders who can say, you know what, the, the, my target groups, focus groups, tell me right. that, that people want it. But you know, I'm going to compare for why because I think why is right, and I think that if I manage to convince people that why is right, then I'm going to be a much more long-term successful politician. We, right. we we didn't have these people anymore. So it really is. It's almost like the it's like a marriage made in hell between the financial sector and the politicians, pretty much. So when when the EU came back to you guys and offered really what was. If anything, I think you could describe it as ransom more than anything else. They, they were going to force Greece to take it, basically. But was, there was a referendum on it, right? Are you talking about 2015 when I was yeah. in government? Yeah. Well, look, it's very, very simple. Um, before we were elected, our central bank had started a bank run against our banking sectors. Can you believe that? Yeah, it doesn't make sense. And, and, uh, central banks were created to stop bank runs. Right. Our central bank, which is the Central Bank of Europe, which is stationed in Frankfurt, intentionally began a bank run in order to start pushing, pre putting pressure on a government that had not been elected yet, only because of the opinion polls. Were, and why, why did they want to, to asphyxiate us before we were elected? Because people like me were saying that once we get elected, we'll go to them and say, folks, um, we need to um, reboot the, 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 the whole program for Greece. Mm -hmm. That this is not working, when we need three things. First, we need a substantial debt restructure, because unless we have a substantial debt restructure, we are not going to be able to have sensible budget surplus targets 
because you know when I got into the ministry, I inherited the surplus target of four and a half percent of GDP for the next fifteen years. That has never happened in capitalist history for a country to have four and a half percent budget surplus, especially a broken economy like this. If you try to extract four and a half percent surplus from this economy, which which what what is what's been happening now for five six years, yeah, you destroy it. The only way to do it is by keep increasing, ratcheting up tax rates, and having your tax take diminish. So here I am, a left winger, <laughs> using Reaganite arguments <laughs> and Africa, for God's sakes. I mean, yeah. you know, just you have to realize that this is things are, are so uh, ridiculous in Europe. That H- how did that feel for you? How did that feel for you? Because I fully, I fully understand what you're saying there. You're now having to use logic that traditionally you wouldn't have used because they basically have a gun to the head of your country. Well, look, the, when things get really bad, um, common sense binds people of the left and the right. And um, vested interests divide. The, 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 that was, you know, I, I, even to this day, David, let, let, let me tell you what, I mean, what happened to me three weeks ago, right? I was um, in, uh, where was, was I? I was in, a, in Frankfurt. I was in Frankfurt. I couldn't remember which German city because I travel a lot in Germany. Yep. So in the morning, I addressed 600 German bankers. In the afternoon, actually evening, I addressed uh, 1,200 activists, left-wing activists. Wow. Yeah. Why, am I t- why am I telling you this? Because I gave the same speech, exactly the same speech. But the but it was an experiment. And I got a standing ovation both with the bankers and the left-wing activists. This is how, you know, where we are now here. Because uh, the, the, the left-right divide is a very important one. But in a functioning capitalism, in a capitalism which has a degree of vitality about it, and then there's a question of the distribution of income between labor and capital, between uh, those who argue that investment needs to be kept up through state intervention, free marketeers who argue that the, the best thing that the state can do is commit suicide. You know, we can have these arguments but capitalism has to be functioning for us to have these arguments sensibly. When you are in a situation like we are in Greece today, or in, actually in Germany, uh, because this is a common crisis, a European crisis, uh, there's, there's no room for disagreement along the, the lines of left and right. Take my country here in Greece, I'm speaking to you from Athens. Well, there is no conflict of interest, there's no class conflict between capital and labor now, because you have entrepreneurs who are dying, whose companies are, are bankrupt, well and truly bankrupt, they have no access to banks. Banks do not operate as credit institutions. Dem- demand is constantly de- diminishing. Tax rates are constantly going up, and they are hanging on for their life. And they do not want to fire workers. They do not want to reduce their workers' wages, but they can't make ends meet anyway. And you have this situation where you have trade unions and employers getting together and crying in each other's arms. So this is the moment when the left-right divide simply disappears. It's a question of common sense. Mm-hmm. So when you have a bankrupt state, bankrupt banks, bankrupt corporations, bankrupt pension funds, and bankrupt households, uh, the only thing you can do is you can say, okay, folks, we, we must stop extending and pretending this bankruptcy through getting more loans on conditions that shrink aggregate demand further. So, you know, the, the, this, this is the situation we're facing now. And you mentioned the, the referendum. That was an amazing moment in world political history. Because think about it. Here we... Here I was going to the Eurogroup. The Eurogroup is the finance minister's informal group that makes all the important decisions in Europe in a completely anti-democratic fashion, but nevertheless, it's where it all happens. Yeah, I want to get to that in a little bit. And I am presenting to them what, I'll tell you, Larry Summers, because he was one of the people helping me. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I even went to bed with Larry Summers, for God's sake. (laughs) Not literally, I don't think, right? Not literally, not literally. (laughs) Okay, just... You know, you'd be misquoted very easily, you know. No, but, you know, I used any, anyone that could help me that had some clout internationally. Larry Summers was excellent in that regard because, as I said, when common sense is, the, is common, <laughs> um, there's, no sense, there's no reason why we should not collaborate with anyone who can help, even with the prisons of darkness, as I call Larry Summers. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, we had with Jeff Sachs, Larry Summers, uh, Norman Lamont, the former chancellor of uh, the Exchequer in Britain, finance minister of Britain under the Conservatives. That was my team of, 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 uh, of, of helpers and aides and advisors. So I put to the Eurogroup um, 
a proposal, a fully fledged proposal for recovering Greece. That when Larry Summers read it, he said, hmm, this is something a, a Wall Street bankruptcy lawyer would have put together. It was that left wing, <laughs> you know, not at all, in other words. Right. So I put it to them, okay, and I'm going, think about it. I'm going to the IMF. Christine Lagarde is there, Paul Thompson from the IMF, people who are supposed to be neoliberals in the parlance of the left. Um, and I'm saying to them, folks, we need to reduce corporate tax rates. It's ridiculous to have 29, 26, 27, 28% corporate tax rate in Greece when in Bulgaria, which is only a short drive away, it's 10%. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is ridiculous to have a, a sales tax of, tax of 23% in a country where people can't afford to pay sales taxes. They can't afford, uh, afford, afford to, buy, to buy anything. So let's reduce those tax rates. Let's have a debt restructure. Let's remain, retain the, the surplus in the government budget, but reduce it so as not to choke the private sector. Let's have a development bank. Mm-hmm. Let's have a bad bank to deal with the NPLs and non-performing loans. These are very simple. And they would strike me down and they would demand increases in tax rates, further increases, which is what happened after I resigned. Right. They demanded more extended pretend loans. This is the neoliberals from the IMF. Now, it was clear that they had nothing to do with economics. It was all about power politics. Mm-hmm. It was about how to snuff out the government that they didn't like. It was a coup d'etat. That's what it was. So we, we took this to the Greek people. We said that, okay, the Europe is proposing this package of supposed measures and policies, which we consider to be catastrophic. Yeah. But, you know. Basically to, to own you forever, pretty much. Yeah, but, you know, owning a depleting asset. Uh, yeah. It was, it was, you know what my problem was during the negotiations? It was a unique problem, I think, in history. I was negotiating with creditors that did not want their money back. Hmm. Because if you want your money back, you do what I said we should be doing to allow the economy to grow to get your money back. Mm -hmm. But it's not that they they didn't know what they were doing. They They were happy to sacrifice Greece in order to win Spain. And want in order to win France and Italy, because this is a domino theory that yeah. they have, that if you give concessions to Greece, then the Spaniards will want it, then the French will want it. So Greece was, there was never a discussion, a serious discussion about an economic policy for helping Greece recover. They didn't want Greece to recover. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's, 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 it's mind boggling. You sacrifice a whole people in order to do, to do what? To maintain an unsustainable monetary union with France. At yeah. that point. You see what will happen now in France. <laughs> in, in next years, just sure. w- watch and see how the silliness that they did in Greece is going to bite them in France. Uh, so, but but as Democrats, I said, okay, right, I'm going to go to the Greek people and I'm going to put to the Greek people your proposal. And if the Greek people say yes, I will accept it because I'm a Democrat. I will hate it, but I, I, I also said I will resign personally and let somebody else who believes in it do it. Right. As as we should in a democracy. And, and the, the, the European Union uh, reacted to this, do you know how? By closing down our banks. Mm-hmm. They shut the banks down. They reduced, they, it's like the, the Fed um, refusing liquidity to Citibank tomorrow morning. Citibank is finished, mm-hmm. gone. It was, it was, all the ATMs will cease to, to, to function. Yeah? This right, so this was, the, this was virtually in so the United had... States. This was like our only moment where we even heard about this because suddenly for you know, one day there were some videos of, pe- of Greek people going to ATM machines yeah. and not getting out money. We didn't hear anything about any of the things that led up okay. to it. That's what we heard about. And then we didn't hear about yeah. anything after that. So and the only reason why they did that was to have a week before the referendum of effectively blackmailing the Greeks, saying to them, vote yes to the, to the Eurogroup's measures, mm-hmm. otherwise your banks will never open again. And why am, am I saying that this was a remarkable moment? We had every single television channel bombarding people with propaganda that they should vote yes to save the country. And that if they, very, if they vote no, it will be Armageddon. They could not get access to their money. Okay. I was the finance minister that was responsible in the eyes of everyone for the fact that the banks had shut down, even though it wasn't my doing, it was the, the central banks against me. But nevertheless, I, I was, it was on my watch that mm-hmm. all the banks closed down. And I, I had approval ratings of 75% during that week. I, we would go out on the street and people would lift us on their shoulders. You know why? Because they say, we don't care about our money in the bank. It's a question of dignity. Mm-hmm. You can't say yes to this. It's a moment of truth. It's a moment of liberation. It's a moment of, you know, national sovereignty, after all. You cannot impose upon us 
this kind of coup d'etat and expect us to yield because we lose our money, stuff our money. And we got 62% of people voting no. Unfortunately, my prime minister on that night capitulated and I resigned. 